I grew up in a storytelling culture. My granddad told a lot of of uh, stories, and 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 ghost stories were a part of it. Ghost stories are not just there to be scary. If they're good ghost stories, they're there to teach you some kind of a lesson. And uh, this one legend about a horse that could never be captured, the ghost horse, this pacing white stallion that could never be captured, no matter how hard any Mustang or tried to capture it. And it's really a story about the inner spirit of people and animals. And this horse became a, a, a symbol of conquering the spirit, you know, and uh, take control of your spirit. So the, the tradition was that the horse would come right out to the edge of a, of a canyon, kind of lead a Mustanger out there, and before he could get his rope on the Mustang, the horse would either charge, or if he saw a gun or something like that, his choice would be to turn around and just leap into the chasm and give up his life, but then come back as a spirit. I think with Dad, it's truly an art. It's something that, that's deep in his soul from the music he grew up with, and he tried to emulate that, but also innovate it. And he was lucky to be around uh, some amazing musicians in California, like John McEwen, who also taught me quite a bit of guitar, uh, but also Steve Martin, who's quite the banjo player. They were all friends in California. John taught Steve and my dad, and then he kind of took it in a different direction with the songwriting which is part of the, I think that's the magic part when he sings and plays. It's that mystery. He puts an amount of mysticism in his lyrics. Um, and I don't think it's on purpose, but he has a way of making a song feel like you almost know what it means, but you'll never know what it means. My first memory was watching dad play his banjo. And I was probably around four years old and uh, when he would play the banjo, it just seemed like he had some kind of trick up his sleeve. Like I knew that he was playing music, but it seemed like magic because there was more sound coming out than two hands could make. So he had like the melody going and the chords going and he was singing and it just seemed like magic. And later on I realized that it is magic because no one can play the banjo like that. It's actually really hard. <laughs> I tried and then I gave it up at age eight. I was given a banjo pretty early, but I switched to guitar because I still can't figure out how he does that. And so I've really tried to do that with my music as well and with my guitar playing. Um, you always want to leave an element of mystery because that's where the magic is. I'd say that's the primary thing that drives everything I do. It's just the landscape, nature, and the things that I see in nature and the things I don't see in nature that are hidden. Those are, those are the things that give me imagery for what I'm feeling. But sometimes they actually drive what I'm feeling. And I think that's because of my parents. My parents were city people. They uh, you know, had nine to five jobs in Dallas, Texas, but my dad would send us off to my grandfather's ranch in the summertime. That was giving up a lot for him because my dad liked to come home from work. He only got a couple of weeks off a year. He liked to come home from work and play baseball with the boys and hang out with us, me and my, me and my brother. For him to send us off, to a ranch that was three or four hours away and they could only get there on weekends. That was a sacrifice for him, but he knew what he was doing. He realized we couldn't learn everything we needed to learn about life by being in an urban environment. And that's because he had grown up with my granddaddy Ed, who was from Kentucky, had an eighth grade education and was a mountain man, and just had the greatest stories. I mean, growing up, other kids would be watching TV when TV first came in, I'm old enough to remember that, by the way, or they'd sit around on the weekends and listen to the radio, the old radio series. My grandfather didn't do that. I mean, he, he listened to the Grand Ole Opry, okay? But uh, he had to tune it in with one of those wind generator radio radios out there in the country. We didn't always get a good signal. Uh, my memories of him was sitting around on a front porch 
rattling iced tea around in a glass after a work day, telling stories, telling jokes and telling stories and talking about the family and talking about other weird stories about people, ghost stories. That was my granddaddy, Ed. And my granddaddy, Murphy, was quite a bit the same way. The granddaddy Ed was my, my dad's stepdad. And he was quite a bit the storyteller also. Just a little bit more of a flamboyant storyteller, and he'd travel the world. And it's just a beautiful setting. It's, everything fits together, and that's what I patterned this after. It's actually an old concept that I picked up when I was a kid when I went to the Flying W. Wrangler in Colorado Springs over uh, by Garden of the Gods. And uh, it was a place where you went to get a meal. You were in a Western setting. They had a Western band playing cowboy songs. And uh, from my era, every kid was in heaven because that was when the singing cowboys were popular. Roy Rogers and Gene Autry and Sons of the Pioneers. So I grew, I grew up on that idea. We have a lot of international tourists here. And they don't come here to see their folklore. They come here to see our folklore and our culture. So uh, that's, that's a good basis of it. But nature doesn't come, pine trees don't come with any particular culture. I agree. It truly is enchanting. And I think Americana existed here before they had a word for it because of the Hispanic, Native American, Texas culture is all coming together. Hey, Daddy, I've got a problem. Well, last night I took my girlfriend for a ride. I think just our relationship has been so important to me over the course of my life. Uh, Dad really is one of my best friends. And over this difficult past year, we talked more than we have in years, almost every day. Um, and that's just such a treasure to, to be able to have that especially in these difficult times, and to be able to create this music that's so positive and energetic in, in such a difficult time. So at least for me, when I was thinking about that song, I was thinking about my childhood and Taos and just how beautiful this area is. And it kind of built on that. So the song really inspired, the song that inspired the album is really, really River Song, even though Blues for 66 was the first. On the album, you'll find more references to Taos than, than anything else which is, I think, important because that was a time in my life where I learned so much about art and history, really more so than living in Texas. New Mexico was very important to me in that way. I've loved the culture I've lived in all my life. Uh, did I ever rebel? Yeah, kind of maybe in the way that I looked at life, I rebelled at times against my parents. But I was only trying to find a new way of being in the culture that I already loved if that makes any sense. Uh, I love the American West. I just, this is such a phenomenal story. It's the American Iliad and the Odyssey. You know, it's the American dream is this great adventure. And it's a, it's a violent upheaval of a clash of culture story. That's what I write about. I write about what happens along that long and winding road that is the road beyond the view. You may never see what's beyond the view. You're going to what you think might be there. And that is the great adventure of life to me. <laughs> what I want to leave people with is that life is a joy and it's also a sorrow. And what you learn from the sorrows increases the joy. In the final end, it's how you dealt with that or how you ask God to help you deal with that. It makes you who you are. Me.